so today's guest is Bram Connolly. Thank you so much for joining me here. Thanks for having me. So Bram, I have done a little social stalk on you before you came in today. Good. And I have to say I'm really impressed and you look much younger than I expected you to look because you've <laughs> done a lot. I keep telling people I eat a lot of broccoli. Broccoli and water, that's the secret to looking young. Fair call. I'll take mm. that into mm. to note when I need that one down the track. Mm. So you're an army veteran. Right. And you're a commando. Mm-hmm. And you were in the army for quite some time. 21 years. So a bloody long time. Yeah, it was a career. <laughs> yeah, mm. fair enough. And when you came out, you have what just hit the ground running. Well, yes. I, yeah. I, guess, <laughs> I guess I did. I think I worked out during my military service that it wasn't going to last forever. So I started to set myself up before I left. Pretty pretty easy transition compared to some people yeah but and i think that the trick to a good transition is you know knowing that the army isn't going to be there or the defense force isn't going to be there for you forever so so i did a degree um an undergrad in international relations majoring in peace studies and societies while i was still in the military Mm. did eight subjects of an mba as well and then i started doing accounting and realizing that i was terrible with numbers so i (laughs) paid that off and just converted it to a um diploma of management and and then you know you get the obvious rpl for as an officer you get the rpl for graduate certificate in government as well so i'd sort of set myself up so i'd be able to move into the civilian sector but i didn't really know what that meant other than i'd have qualifications yeah, fair enough. At least you got out there and you, mm. you recognised that you needed to set yourself up for the future. Mm. What drew you to study that? Well, I had a career advisor who told me that I didn't need a, d- a degree to be a colonel. So that was like a red rag to a bull. So I just <laughs> went and studied what I knew all you know, good officers would study, which is international relations. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think it's, it's one of those degrees where it probably doesn't directly translate to a great job. Mm -hmm. but it gives you a good sort of overview of where the world is at and what makes the world work. And the more I studied, the more I realised that I didn't know very much, um, to be fair. Yeah, fair Mm. enough. Mm. Did you end up using your degree? Oh, well, I mean, I guess I do daily. Critical thinking and, you know, understanding sort of how the media cycle works and, you know, this whole thing about fake news and everything like that at the mm, moment, I topic. guess, yeah, I guess I, I sort of understand how the Trump administration in particular is using that as an agenda item for them and how to how to twist and change, uh, change the narrative. So I, in some ways, the degree has been really helpful, but it's not like an engineering degree or, or something tangible where I could just walk up and say okay I'm qualified in this give me this job Mm -hmm. it was it's more theoretical and you still have to be able to sell yourself yep Mm. yeah fair enough Mm. Uh, so you know it's not like an arts degree where you do it and then you then they end up using it in your life well I suppose (laughs) it is like a a bit like an arts degree and I'm I'm, you know I didn't realize when I was in the military but I am quite artistic in some ways Mm. um, or creative so you know and I I realized when I started getting (laughs) when I started getting you know, distinctions and high distinctions and, and the usual you know, credits here and there. But I would be told by my lecturers, you know, your essays read more like magazine articles than essays. So I started to realise that perhaps I needed to look in another more creative area than, than politics. Yeah. So what you've done and you've released two books? Uh, I have. I've released two books, in one in 2016, one in 2017. The first one was The Fighting Season. The second one is Off Reservation. And I'm writing a third book at the moment, which is non-fiction. Uh, well, I haven't told anyone what the title is yet, so I'm not going um, <laughs> to... We're not going to get the exclusive You're not going right to get it here, but <laughs> it, it is a self-development book based on my military career. And the fact that I saw myself as a pretty average person mm-hmm. being able to achieve you know, some fairly incredible things and I, I think the reason for that was was well I'm basically so crap at everything that I had to <laughs> that I had to try really hard at all these other things so yeah it's about how to be well-rounded and it sort of fits in nicely with some of the other things I'm doing at the moment with Warrior You and and the um, Warrior You podcast as well. So what is Warrior You? Right well what it was when it was first designed was basically a platform that I could get all my friends to help mentor a whole bunch of kids who wanted to join the military. Mm -hmm. That's what it started out as. And we had quite a lot of success with that. 
because we were cheaper than most of the other things out there, we're just paying the website off and doing it for doing it for our own sort of I don't know, fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wanted to use another term there, but I didn't want you to have to edit it out. <laughs> and then over time, we started to get interest from people in the private sector that had no, they had no sort of desire to join the military at all. They just wanted to learn from our operational experience and our special forces backgrounds. And then, then we had some athletes come along that wanted some, you know, mindset and mental focusing and and resilience training and t- you know, mental toughness. And then it sort of started to change as well, where I made friends with some really remarkable academics who said, well, you're onto something here and this is the theory behind this. So Warrior, you started out as a, you know, a platform to help people join the military and it's slowly turning into a human optimization website. Yeah. So at, at the moment, we have 130 full paying members who have access to the, the mentors on the site, their training programs and, and the lessons, the cultural immersion lessons for the military. But there's also now lessons that are, that are being populated on there about mental toughness and resilience and emotional intelligence and all the things that I had that I didn't realize. And, you know, leadership is obviously a big component part of that. And now reaching into the US, we're starting to look at doing one-on-one mentoring with people as well, which they can gain through the website. You know what? It's a really fancy way of trying not to say it's a life coaching platform (laughs) because I hate that term, life coaching or lifestyle engineer. But I guess if I was being honest, it's it's a platform that helps us to help people achieve their goals. And if I can't find a mentor, you know, directly, then I know someone who can. It Mm. sounds really different to all the other life coaching things you get out there too, because a lot of them are like. You know, positive energy and oh, think it's not wishy washy. Kind of like we call people yeah. out, and there's people we've turned away. Like we can't help some people, um, <laughs> and and it, yeah, it is quite in your face if they take the direct route and ask us to one on one mentor them, which mm. is you know it's it's not cheap and it's not easy. Mm. Well, military definitely isn't easy, is it? Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of life skills that you can pull out of the military. So you're trying to teach these to, to young people who are just interested in joining or mm. just looking to gain those skills themselves. Yeah, uh, some of the terms that get thrown around quite often in that sort of lifestyle coaching space is, you know, be a better version of yourself, um, be better today than what you were yesterday, live your best life, all this sort of stuff. But what I think that we do really well is learn someone, take a forensic sort of look at their life and go, right, if you want to achieve this goal, these are the behaviors you have to change. These are the habits you have to develop. This is the, this is the shit you need to do to be Mm -hmm. tougher, to be smarter, to be faster, to, to whatever it is that you need to do to achieve that goal. And if you don't have any goals and then there's no point reaching out to us because we can't help you. You know, we can't help you be the same. Yeah. It sounds like, like, to me, it's preaching to the choir. Mm. Like, I grew up in the military. I grew up mm. being taught that stuff by my, both my parents who were both veterans. And then you come out into the civilian world, and a lot mm. of people don't have that mindset, and they mm. have the bit of a woe is me thing. And it's uh, it's hard to see sometimes. You're like, you know, mm. shake them and go, come on, buddy. Like, right. just pull yourself together. Yeah, we take, it, we take it for granted, the fact that we are given imposed discipline up front in the military. Mm-hmm. And people think that the military is all about imposed discipline. It's not. It's imposed discipline until you can show the self-discipline to then move forward. That's what Kapuka and RMC are all about. So a lot of civilians don't understand that. They don't see the imposed discipline. They've never had it. So they're, they're floundering around looking for self-discipline when they don't know what good looks like. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like, this is what good looks like. This is what a perfect day would be. And then do that. And then replicate that. And then replicate it again. And then have a five-year plan and then have that nested with six-month blocks and then have that into weekly days and then have a perfect day and then continue to do that until you reach your goal. It's pretty easy. Sounds easy to me. Yeah, it's easy. (laughs) So what does the Warrior You podcast Mm. give to that program? Well, I mean, you're a marketing person, so you know exactly what it does. Well, I do, but... (laughs) Yeah, so the the Warrior You podcast allows me to reach more people. Mm Mm-hmm. It allows me to advertise myself and also some of the great mentors um, so people can hear what we're doing. It gives me a hook to put um, adverts for free for Warrior You in that podcast. But also what I'm finding at the moment is the more people listen to the podcast, the more people talk to their friends, those friends contact someone great, that person contacts me 
and then they're back on the you know the wheel they're on the podcast and so it's giving me more access to a wider market of uh, mentors to be honest and there's people in the states who are reaching out to be on the podcast i mean the market over there is so huge yeah it is and here there's nothing like that i mean if i could be you know a millionth as successful as lewis howes and joe rogan and those people who are putting positive messages out there and influencing people then i'd be happy Mm. yeah fair enough well you're really one of the the first people that i've seen coming from your background here in australia trying to do this so you could be blazing the trail well i'm trying i don't get much support in australia but because we don't have that same vection for our veterans Mm. and servicemen that the states do we talk about it yeah but we don't like i mean I, i talk to people i talk to people in america who are coos so chief operating officers of of some big companies over there you know, like, and who comes to mind is Exxon or Chevron and places like that. And they have veteran programs that reach out and they look for guys like me. They look for girls, you know, who are at the top of their mm-hmm. their game, getting out of the military because they, they straight away give a whole other way of thinking about things. It's, a, it's, a, it's diversity, but it's not diversity based on color or ethnicity. It's diversity of thinking. Mm-hmm. And if you can get that diversity of thinking into your business... And especially with a military leader sort of bent on it. So if you are if you have a, a military leadership background, you bring a whole new range of skills that a civilian company needs. They don't know they, they need yet. You know, I, I don't know why Australia won't get behind people, whether it's a tall poppy syndrome or what it is, which, again, it's none of my business what anyone thinks of me. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't, I don't go around looking for feedback from people who don't matter. But there's people out there that do matter that can help uh, veterans with positive, you know, news stories. Positive. Oh, I could go down a rabbit warren here <laughs> about <laughs> veterans and, you know, and, and how we've done ourselves a disservice mm-hmm. in Australia. I get it. I know talking to to one veteran, she runs a small program called Working Spirit. She's trying to help people, her veterans, transition into the, the regular workforce. And she said that a lot of places have this mindset that a Australian veterans just going to walk in with a gun and shoot the players up. Right. Well, the problem is that straight away there's a victim narrative out there about mm-hmm. veterans. Yeah. I know you didn't bring me on here to talk about this, but no, no, I'm go obviously for it. passionate about it. <laughs> um, 90% of the people I know have had amazing careers, brilliant experiences, and they are the very quiet minority mm-hmm. who are very passionate about having served in the military. Whether that's four years in the Air Force, 30 years in, in SAS, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You know, they're passionate about that. They're the quiet minority because what we have is a, is a really large um, you know, minority of people who talk about how the Army and DVA has done them wrong. Yep. And you know, gold cards this and this, that and the other. There is people out there who have PTSD. I have no doubt about that. Mm-hmm. No doubt about it. Seen it firsthand. I've taken guys to war. I've got credibility. You know, I can tell you what what it, what it looks like. A lot of people can't. Some some people have a separation anxiety sort of a disorder going on where they leave the military, and it's the first time they've left something that had all that structure in place, and had a great uniform and and the armor. The uniform is your armor. Mm-hmm. You know, suddenly that's stripped away and they're out there and they're depressed. And of course they're depressed. They're depressed because they now are not part of a high-performing team. They've got to go on their own and, and try and blaze a trail. And it's bloody hard, yeah. you know. And then we've got healthcare professionals who are hamstrung to provide the right service for mental health that they classify everything as PTSD. Mm-hmm. So the people with true PTSD aren't getting the help. The people with depression are stigmatized uh, with things that are a lot worse than, than what depression is. Everyone gets depressed. Bloody old. You know, I watched Perth Glory lose to Chelsea the other day. I was yeah, depressed. <laughs> you know, like it's, the, but we, do, we just have the wrong conversations. And then, and then what we build is this victim narrative that people get to cling on to. Or I want to build a positive narrative where people can go, hell yeah, I got this awesome experience. I joined the military. I did this, well, the Defence Force. I did this great thing. I'm going to get out and I'm going to be wanted by, I'm going to be wanted by, you know, society. I'm going to be wanted by a big business. I'm going to be wanted by the corporate world for those, you know, because I've got these stories. And then we, we, then people get into the corporate sector and they start selling it and they go, God, I want two more of these. I want three more of these. And the next thing you know, there's an arms race on to, to get all these people as they're coming out of the military. Mm-hmm. And that's what has happened in America. That has definitely happened in America. Yep. You've got 
chief operating officers, chief executive officers, you've got heads of HR searching for those bright young people that have come out of the military. And we need that. 100% agree with you. Hmm. Yeah, like I have no Rant points to over. argue. <laughs> yeah. I have no points to argue with all that because there are so many life experiences yeah. and so many skills that you learn. Right. And don't get experience. me don't get me wrong. You know, I know there's people out there that are struggling. I completely get that. And for a while there, I used to have the whole snowflake thing going on, like just toughen up. <laughs> but but now I look back on it. I've got two young boys. I went to Somalia in 1993 as a as a 19 year old. Mm-hmm. I probably got through that unscathed because I was 19 years old and had no idea what the hell was going on. Indestructible on right. age. Right. <laughs> well, well, not just that. Stupid. A kid. <laughs> and yet there was people there who were in their 30s and 40s that had kids that would have found that really emotionally challenging and would have would have come back to Australia with PTSD. And, the, and Somalia veterans pretty much have been forgotten about in this country, I might say, which mm-hmm. is a real bloody problem. But, you know, those guys would have really struggled with that. And for years, I, didn't, I couldn't work out why, not until I had my own kids. And then suddenly seeing starving kids in Africa is like, yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah. I understand now. I understand that, you know, perhaps I was a little bit too harsh on some of those people. You know, full kinetic warfare in Afghanistan, completely different than what we did in Somalia. But both of them have the, you know, the ability to, both of those experiences have the ability to affect people in different ways. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've had my own mental health issues. I was a, a medic and I had to stop doing that because I developed PTSD. Mm. And for a long time, I had that victim narrative going for myself. But you're right. At some point, you have to turn around and say, no, you can I'm recover. My story. You can recover from that. You know? Yeah, don't, exactly. And don't, let, don't ever let one day in time define you for the rest of your bloody life. Yeah. You know, like I had a really massive contact that we were involved in in Afghanistan that I could hang my hat on, leave the military and go, this was the most amazing thing that ever happened. I'll never have anything as brilliant as that again. All these guys won these awards. We're this, you know, this, that and the other. But but it's just it's just one day. You know, and there's been lots of good days since and there'll be lots of good days to come. Yep, yeah, life goes on. You've got to yeah. And if you've got PTSD, it. you can get over it. You can get help for that. Yeah, you, you know? can treat it. Yeah, it can be it's treatable and you can live a fulfilling life and guess what? You know, you've you've gone through something that can be, you know, traumatic growth. Yeah, traumatic you know I mean? growth. You're stronger now than you were before. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, God, there's been crap out there that scared me, you yeah. know, but <laughs> you move on. Yeah. And so part of what you do now is you train people in leadership values right. and you're a motivational speaker. Yeah. What's all that like? Uh, okay, so I work for a, a mining company, um, Pi Bar, actually. They're a um, mining services company. Plug. Yep, and it's a brilliant <laughs> family-owned business. And I'm, I guess I'm the head of leadership My official title is supervisor trainer, but I run a leadership program and we look at cultural values and emerging leaders predominantly and client facing leaders. Yeah. And it's awesome because I get to talk about leadership all day. I get to study leadership all day. I get to do pillar content for Warrior U and the podcast. And also that feeds back into the business. Mm. I get to talk to academics about leadership and the difference between management and leadership. It made me realize what a genius Simon Sinek is, mm-hmm. if you've watched any of his you know, YouTube videos, because most of the stuff that he... And Simon Sinek, for those who don't know, is an, uh, an incredible American academic and speaker, and he talks about you know, finding your why is one of his most famous topics. But with regards to you know, leadership is basically getting someone else to do something that you want them to do mm-hmm. because they want to do it. Yeah. It's building a fan base. And so, so I try and teach people... Well, this is what leadership looks like, and this is what management looks like. And management's not a bad word. It's not a dirty word. Being a manager isn't a dirty thing. Just that being a leader is for a different organization, for a different set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Some people think that they're leaders and they're managers. They go through processes and checklists and boxes and, and the like, and people go home safe. And then some people think they're leaders, but they're not. They're just doing what a manager does. A leader will inspire and will take everyone on a journey and he'll build a fan base. He or she will build a fan base. Mm -hmm. And trying to get that out into the wider community so that our businesses are more effective, I think is my, the key thing that I'm trying to do through all of these different, God, it's exhausting, different things that I'm (laughs) trying to to run at the same time. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, do you ever just sit down on the couch and watch Netflix? Super important. <laughs> I I have a door to the house that's mm-hmm. different to the rest of the house, and I walk through that door, and it goes into the gym, and I'll do something in there, and it will disengage me, or I'll go for a run. I'll disengage from the day so that when I get in to be around the kids, it's here I am, I'm 100%, 100% committed to being with you. 
And yeah, Netflix and chill. That's a thing. <laughs> it's um, a thing. But my brain does seem to just continue going around and around and around. And I come up with ideas and I'll grab a piece of paper and I'll walk off somewhere and close the door and come up with a concept. And mm-hmm. I'm good at visualizing concepts. I'm not so great at getting traction with them, <laughs> which is why I'm a lousy entrepreneur. <laughs> I've got all these ideas, but no, I don't really know how to, you know, pull the trigger, I guess. But yeah, anyway. This is where the leadership skills come in, right? You inspire people and then they want to do it for you. Well, I get that. Sometimes <laughs> they do, but people don't want to do much without being paid. Yeah, <laughs> and unfortunately, when you're running a business that, which isn't for profit, you know, you really do have to compel people through their own sort of, you know, self-worth and mm-hmm. through their own love of mentoring to help. Yeah. I think we should probably wrap it up there. Cool. It's been really wonderful talking to you. Your projects sound wonderful. Hmm. Was Thank you. Is there anything that you'd like to leave this with? Well, um, people can follow Instagram or they can go onto the Warrior U website and have a look around. It is changing and, and the like. And I know that you get a massive defense sort of listenership. Mm-hmm. So if any of those people feel that they want to be mentors and they want to help out and they want to inspire, I'm just doing what people do at barbecues and bloody dinner parties and family birthdays anyway we, yeah. we all have that person who comes up and goes oh so you're in the army oh, i'd like to join the army okay well this is how you do it yeah. <laughs> just come and do it on the website instead of doing it there great yeah. wonderful so jump online guys check him out thank you and make sure to read some of his books as well all right thank you very much for coming in cheers this podcast was edited published and produced by the rslwa head to www.rslwa.org.au for other content. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast and follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook.